Please give your attention to the catechist for today, Reverend Dr. Jacob Corzine of Concordia University, Chicago. Don't take offense at what they're doing right now, Jacob. There are certain necessities of life. Concordia Publishing House. What's that? Concordia Oh Publishing yes, he's House. moved to Concordia Publishing House, of course. Well, it is a joy and an honor to speak to you all today about our Lord's precious gifts as they are described in the fourth, fifth, and sixth chief parts of the Catechism, Baptism, Confession, and Absolution, and the Lord's Supper. We will handle Baptism today and a little bit of Confession and Absolution and save the rest for tomorrow. I hope you have your Catechisms along. If you do, I'd ask you to pull them out and turn to page 291. One of the benefits of this catechism is that in this back section, it's filled with prayers, and we will use a couple of these prayers as we move through uh, the catechism today and tomorrow. So please pray with me on page 291. Gracious Father, thank you for the gift of baptism, which your Son has established by his word and promise. Teach us to treasure all that Jesus has done for us in his cross and resurrection. Give us confidence that through our baptism we bear your holy name, and so are your holy children for time and eternity. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The fourth chief part in the Catechism on Baptism is divided itself into four sections. We'll handle them in order. The first addresses the question very simply of what baptism is, what are we dealing with, what has God given us? The second, what benefits does baptism give? Why is it a blessing for us to receive it? The third handles an objection, but it's just water. Why should we expect anything from that? And the fourth will be very interesting for us. It deals with what symbolism is present in baptism, what we can see if we watch closely as it occurs. We'll begin with what baptism is. For this, I'll ask you to turn back a few pages to page 285. So the front of the volume has, of course, Martin Luther's Catechism with Explanation. The back of the volume has that, and then along the way, a lot of these questions and answers um, from our, our more recent editors that help us to understand and apply that to our own lives. So page 285, you'll see in the box that it says the nature of baptism. This is Luther's text. So I'm going to ask you to recite. Use the box if you need it. Use your memory if you can. What is baptism? Which is that word of God? Two parts make up the baptism, the water and the word. We'll go through them quickly. It's helpful to just divide these things up. So first, the water. There isn't anything special about the water. We drink with water, we wash our hands with water, we clean other things with water. That's really all that matters, is that we use water. Now, clean water is nice. Clean water may be a luxury. Any water will do. Jesus commands us to use water, but we find the power in the second part, which is his word. And there we have Matthew 28, 19. Christ our Lord says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In these words, he does a few things. He institutes the baptism. He gives it to us. He creates it as a thing for us, which... Um, is a rite or a ceremony in the church. To be sure, we have a special word for it. We call it a sacrament. It is a gift from Christ, and initially all we know is now we have it. It's also, though, a constituting word in that in that verse he tells us what to do. He describes sufficiently the baptism to us that we know how to carry out a baptism. And by instituting and constituting it himself, 
we are allowed to draw the conclusion that he is saying to us, when you do this, I am actively present among you. What a gift. But then we also have a second thing that is attached to the baptism through the word, which is the promise. We have a word of institution, that's language we know, and we have a word of promise, which is language we also ought to know, which is that it makes disciples. It cleanses us of our sin. One of the other things that you'll find in the back of the catechism that helps you to orient yourself is that the Bible passages are all numbered. You're dealing with three sets of numbers, the page numbers, the question numbers, and then the Bible passage numbers. So if you go to page 286, which should just be one turn of page, then Bible passage number 990 is Ephesians 5, 25 and 26. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. And so baptism has this promise that we are cleansed. It has this promise that we are made the disciples of Christ. One more thing before we move on to the second part. As Luther formulates this, how does it begin? Christ our Lord says. So we also get sort of slid in underneath in the grammar the answer to the question of whose baptism it is. It is the baptism of Christ the crucified. It is his work, Christ's work. It is his promise, Christ's promise, Christ's word. Once you hand it over for sprinkling, pouring, or immersing, it becomes his water. And then finally, you become, your child becomes his baptismal child. Let's keep going. Page 292, I'm going to ask you to recite again. What benefits does baptism give? Which are these words and promises of God? So we want to try and hang on to these Bible passages that Luther gives us. And everything that we have here in this benefits section, we can see as an exposition of this one passage, Mark 16, 16, in which Christ takes faith and baptism and ties them so closely together. What is the Christians? Is the Christians by faith? And what the Christian has by faith is given the Christian in baptism. So, what are the benefits? Forgiveness of sins. And here, if you look into um, page 292, question 308, you can follow along a little bit. I'm not going to keep directing you into it. But there we find uh, the Bible passages that support the three things that Luther has given us. Forgiveness of sins, life... But Excuse me, the three things that Christ has given us. Forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. The other things Luther has put into the list for us. So first, forgiveness of sins. Acts 2.38 and Acts 22.16 that you can read there show how baptism brings with it the forgiveness of sins. It's helpful to think of this as belonging to us as God's baptized children over the course of our whole lives. So that we don't make the mistake of supposing that baptism gives forgiveness of sins which have been committed up to the baptism and some other mechanism is preferred for after the baptism. Baptism is intended to encompass your whole life and to give you, and this will be key, certainty of faith that you can return to over your whole life. That you don't I'm going to say it one more time. You don't have the impression that you got a fresh start, a clean slate at baptism, and now you have to have a new plan for the rest. You can always fall back on that confidence that you were baptized. And so you start to see how God forgives not just the sins, but the sinner. The second part, Jesus, uh, baptism rescues from death and the devil. Now, if we would turn back to the sixth petition of the Lord's Prayer, 
we would find what the devil does. He misleads into false belief, despair, and other great shame and vice. These things separate us from God and therefore lead to death. And so the second benefit of baptism is that it rescues from death and the devil. Baptism is your recourse when you are faced with the devil. And this is important. Uh, don't suppose that for a moment the devil leaves the Christian alone. And also don't suppose that because you are baptized, you are somehow rescued from constant assault by the devil. Instead, what is given you in the baptism is something to place your faith in when you are placed under that trial and temptation and uncertainty and doubt and risk of despair, that you have a place to go. You return to your baptism. The third part is eternal salvation. This is the flip side of rescue from death, of course, but we want to almost say this very slowly and very clearly. The scripture teaches that baptism gives salvation. 1 Peter 3.21, page 293, verse number 1008. This water symbolizes baptism, which now saves you. When you're in doubt, when you struggle, when you wonder how it can be possible that you have a true faith, because no true faith could possibly exist alongside sin as great as yours. Know that you belong to God because you are baptized and he has saved you. Not all Christians have this knowledge and the comfort that it brings, but they all should. Part three, how can water do such great things? Turn to page 297 with me. How can water do such great things? Please, certainly. So here's the objection, but it's just water. This is an objection that is still raised today. How can it be that the gifts of God are given not through spiritual, ethereal means, but through something tangible and graspable, maybe a little murky, like water? We have to do this kind of quickly. We know that the benefits don't rely on the water because we know what the benefits are and we, like everyone else, knows that water doesn't forgive sins. And so the conclusion is simple. It must actually be the word. So then the question is, why connect these things together? Why tie the word to the water? And I think that, at least for us today, it tears down this mistaken way that we think about God's promises, which is that they are built into the life that he has created for us, ready for us to grab hold of or not at any moment, and if we grab hold of them correctly, then we will succeed. Train up a child in the way he will go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Seems like it works a lot of the time. Doctor, speaking of time, one minute. I was told I had six more, and I should shave one. One minute. You're the boss. Think of your baptism this way, Isaiah 43, 1. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. But he doesn't stop there. He says, for I have called you by name. You are mine. 40 seconds. Here we go. Baptism 
indicates in the last part that you are put to death and raised to life. And this points us forward to the daily activity of the Christian, which is to look to our past, see nothing but sinfulness. It's not pleasant, but it's true. And then to put it to death by returning to our baptism. And that's all the pointing I get to do toward confession. But the absolution relies on the baptism. The absolution is the word of Christ that says you are completely righteous because I have taken away all of your sins by being crucified on the cross. And now you are fully righteous. Go forth in new life. We will have to continue tomorrow. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Corzine.